It's not the finest, but it'll do. It's a summer night, and Brian and Aiden are standing in the kitchen of a posh golf course that everyone from school works at. At least, everyone cool. Which happens to be the only reason that Brian took the job in the first place. With its shitty $6 an hour for scrubbing well-to-do spit and grime off hundreds if not thousands of plates, forks, and knives. But hey, it affords him other interesting opportunities. Like now. Aiden hands Brian his first glass of whiskey. It had come back from the bar completely untouched. Aiden says, what a waste of five bucks, then smells it. Wisers. Brian looks at the glass and thinks, how could he know that by smelling it? What is he, a whiskey connoisseur? Ignoring the temptation to call his friend out on his bullshit, he downs the whole shot in one gulp and lets it burn all the way down and coughs. Behind a shit-eating grin, Aiden chuckles, says, you're supposed to sip fine whiskey, in a faux southern accent. Brian looks around for anyone who might have seen him, then's reminded that the kitchen staff has left except for the dishwashers and a few of the wait staff, the bar back attending the 200 guest party in the grand ballroom. Thing is, they're too young to drink. Thing is, they're at work. Aiden then grabs a lipstick stained glass of wine and downs it. We getting drunk tonight. The doors to the grand ballroom swing wide and in comes the oldest woman that Aiden and Brian had ever known. Behind her, Kenny G is doing something shitty on the clarinet, and then is silenced by the swinging doors that flap, flap, flap. They both smile as Aiden places the guilty glass on the tray, and then Brian places his in his pocket, hoping that she hadn't noticed. The black and white waitress uniform she has on is stained on the left breast with shitty gravy that they always use at wedding parties like this. She's impossibly hunched over, and yet with what may be her last moments of life, she's still hard at work. A tray in her left hand littered with empty glasses and in her right is a pack of smokes. She walks directly in between the boys without a word and slides the tray into the cold steel of the industrial dishwasher. Both of the boys are a chin over her in height and can see that in between her neatly pinned white and gray hair she's balding in some spots. She steps back from the two boys and says, You boys can hunker down for a while. She places a fresh menthol between her lips and continues with the cig bobbing up and down against her lips and her dentures. The party's dancing now. We won't be bringing much dishes back for a couple of hours. That means cake for you. Money for nothing. Just as she's about to leave, Brian asks, What are you doing later? You want to go on a date? Aiden snorts, chuckles. Behind her horn-rimmed glasses, her eyes show a tinge of the woman she once was. Almost beautiful. She replies, Brian, sarcastically with her cigarette still bobbing up and down. This old pussy could teach you things. Things you never heard of, jailbait. The two boys balked at the joke gone awry. She continues, When we're done, it won't just be your balls that are empty. I'll leave your whole body shriveled more than even mine. She leaves out the door for the help, and the boys look at each other and begin to laugh heartily. Brian had been owned, and he was proud of it. However, that wouldn't stop him from flirting with the old shrivel tits. That's what he and Aiden called her even though her name was Gladys and she had been in the army, born five children and thereafter 18 grandkids and 15 great-grandkids. She always joked about being an old whore after her husband of only 20 of her 90 years had passed away, saying that her last son wasn't her husband, but in fact the milkman's. That's how come he's so strapping and handsome and not ugly like the rest. Their laughter died down. Aiden and Brian tended to the last tray of dishes they would see for hours cleaning spit and grime of well-to-do partygoers down the drain and sending the tray of dishes into the machine. In they go, as filthy as sin, and out they come as clean as Jesus, Gladys would say. Being young, they were feeling just a little bit of the tingle that alcohol provides. Their senses dulled and their work done for a while, they did what they always did on nights like this. Find the beer cart, raid it, and then go joyriding in one of the golf carts. The beer cart was where it could usually be found, locked in the pro shop garage to which for some reason Aiden had been entrusted a key. In the shadows of the garage adjacent the pro shop, the two boys make a find amongst all the Sam Adams and Coronas. In the cooler of the cart, buried in half-melted ice, Aiden finds an unopened bottle of Southern Comfort. He lifts it out, dripping, and kisses it. He says, Holy shit, dude. We're not just getting drunk tonight. We're getting hammered. He holds out his hand to Brian, who low-fives him, gripping the fingertips at the end so they both snap. Brian says, oh shit, guess what? Then pulls out the shot glass which had laid silent in his pocket until now, forgotten. Aiden nods his approval and says, let's go get one of the golf carts. Fuck yeah, Brian replies. 
The chug of the little 20 horsepower cart sounded like freedom to them. Aiden drove and Brian sat shotgun with the bottle between his legs as they fired away to the ninth hole to get neat and clean. Off they went as filthy as sin, with no floodlights to guide them into the black. Upon reaching the hole, the air was still and the sky was clear enough to see the stars. It was the perfect time for whatever the fuck. Aiden opened the bottle and poured the first of many shots of Soko. That's what they called it, Soko, and handed it to Brian. The taste was worse than the wisers he had drank. It was sweet and gross. The glass was handed to his friend and he poured some for him. Brian delighted at the sight of his friend wincing at the flavor, and they just kept going on like that, silently drinking for an hour and staring at the stars and listening to the frogs in the artificial pond. Chirp, chirp, chirp. Brian seeing everything in celluloid film that was off-kilter with the spokes that turned it over white-hot light. Aiden had his chin on his chest as if asleep with his eyes open. Do you think we could get arrested for driving drunk on a golf cart? Aiden lifts his head from his chest, and as if they had been talking the whole time, he says, Nah, we're just kids. Can you imagine them sending two teenagers to jail? Nah, but technically you're the only one who's been driving, so I'd be okay. True, I'll have to make sure I don't drop the soap. What the fuck does that even mean? Brian asks, half rhetorically. You don't drop the soap so you don't get buff- I know what it means. I mean, it really doesn't make any sense if you think about it. Aiden leans in, interested. Brian continues. Well, if you think about it, if you're facing the shower head, your ass is still just as much exposed as if you were bent over. True, Aiden says, nodding. I mean, if like some dude wanted to just grab you from behind and- he points his middle finger up and makes a farting noise for emphasis. Aiden looks up and thinks with his eyes, drinks directly from the bottle of Soko and says, that's why you'd have to face away from the shower head so you can see them coming. Brian pauses momentarily, holds out his hand for the bottle, which Aiden hands over, takes a swig of the now tasteless liquor and replies, ah, but then your junk would be exposed. They both become very silent. Aiden thunders the cart to a start and says, well, I guess we'll have to not get caught. Tooling down the golf course road, they light up a cigarette and pass it back and forth. There's a sudden flash of light off to their left. One of the timed floodlights had been turned on, and Aiden, scared but also very drunk, tips the wheel sharply to the right. The cart, the two boys, and the bottle of whiskey go careening down the embankment toward the artificial pond. The screams of the two boys were loud enough to have been heard all the way back at the ballroom. The 20 horsepower golf cart crashed into the water with such force that Aiden bit his lip, and Brian, who had been gripping the shot glass, had broken it upon impact with his palm. The cart floated for a minute and then began to sink. The boys jumped ship and waded back to the embankment. Neither had noticed their injuries. As they scrambled onto dry land, they could hear the bubbles floating to the surface of the water. They sat back panting as the cart began to sink, and then the motor died. They were immersed in silence again. Brian looked at his hand, which had been cut in several places, said, Damn it, I wanted to keep that shot glass, and then started to laugh. They both did. Aiden, catching his breath, said, I think we might have to get new jobs after this, all the while laughing at the sight of the visible golf cart underneath the water.